selling houses for nearly 35 years and has consistently been um, one of the top realtors in Minnesota. Like all of us, Jeff has experienced both business and personal challenges off and on uh, during his career. But in 2001, he began what would have been his toughest battle, the battle of his life. Diagnosed with aplastic anemia, he was told that his prognosis was grim and to get his affairs in order. Through prayer, faithful expectation, and sheer determination, Jeff optimistically ran that race to win and beat the disease. And today, he is in perfect health. After his miraculous recovery, he continued to build upon his successful real estate business while penning two books, The Promise, which is now available in five languages, and The Journey to a Miracle When Faith Was the Only Cure. Jeff has resided in Apple Valley for over 40 years, our neighbors, and he regularly speaks to a variety of businesses and inspirational topics around the world. Please welcome Jeff Sislow. Good morning. I uh, appreciate the opportunity, uh, uh, Rotary Remembers, to uh, invite me to share uh, a story. Hey, uh, that... Jeff, we're gonna, we, we need to up the sound here. Okay. All right, let's try this again. Jeff, we're a little bit older group, so hearing is very important. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Jeff. No worries. We're all, we're all getting there sooner or later, right? Uh, thank you, Rotary members, for inviting me to uh, come and chat with you today and uh, to share a story, a story that I hope and trust will inspire everyone uh, with, with uh, the example that I'll be able to share. So uh, again, I've never been to your group. I know some of the members uh, in your group as I've looked through to see who is in attendance. And again, uh, hello to those that I know and uh, good morning to those that I haven't met before. Um, we've been talking, I've been listening to you talking a little bit about the pandemic this morning. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in our world. Everything has changed over the past year. And, and people respond to situations such as this, and this is a significant uh, situation <clears throat> where people are responding in different ways. Colleen had mentioned, you know, people uh, suicide, and we know that these things are happening, and it's it's a it's it, it's catastrophic in many respects. And so my story will will fit into the situation that we're dealing with right now with this pandemic because it's it's a big deal, and we don't have the answers. We don't have questions. I mean, we have questions, we don't have the answers. Say that properly, but it's it's a real question mark in our minds from our business standpoint, our mental health standpoint, our children, our friends, our family. It's a real big deal. So what I have to share with you today, I believe, I believe that you'll be able to take something from it <clears throat> and that you'll be able to, uh, to, to utilize it as a benefit in dealing with something such as the pandemic that we're dealing with, <clears throat> excuse me. So with that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of get into telling the story that, uh, that I experienced 20 years ago, 20 years ago this year, and uh, just about this time. So I'll, I'll kind of walk you through a little bit of a time frame as I begin with this. Back in the year 2000, I've been in real estate now at that point for about 14 years. And back in 2000, I, I began to experience some of the most most bizarre. I mean, it's like one bizarre event after another. And I won't go through all of the things that I experienced at the moment or at that time, <clears throat> but they weren't normal. They were, they were just abnormal things that were taking place. I was involved in a couple of business startups and they failed. I lost a tremendous amount of money. And I thought, well, this isn't, this isn't, is not normal. And then I, then I uh, later in the year, in the fourth quarter of 2000, for those that know anything about real estate, uh, you know, uh, I was selling a lot of real estate. I was selling over 100 houses a year. But in the fourth quarter, 2000, I sold two houses. I mean, it just, it doesn't make any sense. It was just crazy. I had a real estate team. They quit. Uh, then they took my staff. And so 
I'm going to Cancun. I think uh, it was Greg that was talking about Cancun. I go all the time too. I go in December and uh, I don't know where you go, but I go to the Royal Sands and I go to the same place and I love it. But uh, uh, Cancun is a, is a great place. And we were just getting ready to go to Cancun. Me and my wife at the time and the kids were all getting ready to go to Cancun. I've got no staff. I've got no team. I mean, it's just more and more bizarre things. Now, while these things were going on, what I, what I began doing, and I had been a, a Christian for a long time, and I knew scripture, I know scripture very well, and I found a verse that I started to resonate on and, and uh, remind myself over and over as I, as I worked to be strong through all these challenges, losing money, the business, and I mean, everything was just, everything was bad. <clears throat> and uh, the verses from James chapter one, verses two and three, it says, consider it all joy, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So I kept trying to cheer myself up with that verse and stay positive. And uh, I remember, and some of you may very well know Dave Householder. He used to be pastor over at uh, Hosanna. And I was very involved at Hosanna at the time. And I went into the prayer chapel, and there's a few people there, and Pastor Dave was there. Uh, house, as many of us call him. And I went in there to get some prayer because my world was crazy. It wasn't normal. And it was one thing after the next. And so Dave got a word. He says, the Lord's given me a word for you, Jeff. And here's what he's telling me. He says that the Lord is preparing you for difficult times that lie ahead. I'm thinking, well, I've sure had a lot of them already. Maybe, maybe I'm about done with these, right? He says he's preparing you for difficult times that lie ahead. So that led me to believe that there could be some more trouble down the road. And so uh, anyway, as we got into uh, this vacation, now I closed, the, we, we went to Cancun, I made the decision to go to Cancun, closed the, closed the office, I had no one there, turned off the phone, said I'm on vacation. And with everything being so slow, I mean, we kind of run on cash flow when we're selling houses, I was spending a lot of money marketing. And now we're going into into uh, December, and then we got back around the first of the year, and I've got no one here in the office. There's no one there. So I had to start kind of picking things up and try to get things going and, and so forth. And it wasn't long into uh, about the first part of February of 2001, I started feeling really sick. And uh, lo and behold, I went in and they diagnosed me with some form of hepatitis. And my skin, uh, you know, people told me I look like Michael Jackson in the Thriller movie because my eyes, uh, they weren't white, they were yellow and my face was pale. And I felt really, really, I mean, if you've ever encountered that, it's a terrible feeling. And so I kept trying to work through things and I, you know, uh, went to the office. And then I remember one day, you know, again, things just seem to keep getting worse. And now it's going to start affecting my health. And so I was sitting there at the office one day and I was kind of, my nose felt like I was running and all of a sudden I realized there's blood all over my hands. So my nose, I got a nosebleed. I don't get nosebleeds, but I had one that day. And um, it, it, you know, I went in uh, again and, and uh, would get checked up on. And, and then after, after this uh, isn't bad enough, then uh, my face started to break out where I had boils on my face. Blood would kind of, I mean, I don't even know where this stuff comes from. I don't even know what it was. It was idiopathic. They couldn't explain it. I've got boils in my face, blood coming out of my face, and have this hepatitis. So uh, I kept, you know, I wasn't checked in. I'd go and visit, and they, you know, they said, you know, it'll get better, it'll go away, and so forth. And so um, I was feeling really bad. I had a scratchy throat, and one one day, now we're into early April. And I remember I went uh, to get up to get a banana, help the scratchy throat. And while I was chewing on that banana, I just flipped on the TV. It's like four in the morning. And I saw, I was flipping channels just for a couple of minutes before going back to bed. And there's a Bible verse on there. And I stopped and I read the Bible verse. And it was 1 Peter 5.10. And here's what it says. It says, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ shall himself strengthen, establish, confirm, and perfect you. And I thought, wow, that's great. I says, thank you, Lord, for that promise, because I'm ready to be restored. I'm ready to be strengthened. 
And as soon as I said that, the little voice inside of God said to me, there's more to come. And I thought, oh my gosh. I mean, I, what, what more can I be dealing with than all the stuff I've been dealing with for four to six months? But he said, there's more to come. Uh, so uh, within a couple of days, I went down, uh, my wife and I went to the clinic because I'm feeling so tired. I was dizzy and, and went into the clinic and the doctor gave me a blood test. And then he uh, came back in the room. He says, can you wait here a minute? I'm going to bring your wife in. And so he brought her in and uh, he said, he sat us down and he, with, with just a somber face, the doctor, I'll never forget. He says, I'm sorry, you're really, really sick. I said, oh boy. <laughs> and he says, no, you're really sick. We need to have you emergency transported to the hospital. Where do you typically go? And I said, Burnsville Ridges. Well, they're not going to have what you're going to need. I says, no, oh, this is getting better all the time. This story is not getting any better. It's, I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm trying to deal with all of this uh, report that I'm getting. So uh, United Hospital in uh, St. Paul is where we went. So I got down to United and uh, they did a blood test. Blood, blood's uh, the life of the body. It tells you the, the whole story pretty much. And based on the blood test, they figured that I either was afflicted with aplastic anemia or leukemia. They just didn't know which one. So they, uh, they, uh, uh, gave me a blood transfusion, the first one immediately, because I was so low on, on blood. And, and some of you may know about blood. I'll tell you briefly, uh, your blood's comprised of three predominant components, hemoglobin, platelets, and white cells, which is your immune system. The hemoglobin was 5.9, and it should be for a man about 12, 5 to 18. And I'm at 5.9. No wonder I was dizzy. I had no oxygen. And uh, you, you, if you don't have oxygen to the brain, you don't think, you, you forget things constantly, and it, it's not a good experience. And then the platelet should be anywhere from about 140,000 up to 430,000. Mine was 2,000. So I could have bled internally. I, I was, it's a long story, I won't go into it, but 2,000 was the platelet count. And then the white cells are your immune system, and your predominant white cell is called neutrophil, neutrophils. And I had a whopping 0.0, .0 neutrophils. I had no immune system. It was completely shot. They estimated that the, the disease, aplastic anemia, which is a autoimmune disease, they anticipated or they uh, kind of uh, mapped out that it took three weeks for that disease to kill all my bone marrow. They did a biopsy to confirm it was aplastic anemia. There was no stem cells. There was nothing. Uh, the bones were like dried out on the inside. And so I'm in the hospital. In fact, I was there for 28 days in the hospital, getting tested constantly, um, getting a blood test every day, drawing tubes, uh, getting transfusions every three days. And so this was my regimen in the hospital, but I stayed positive. I stayed positive. And when the, when the doctor came in with these bad news, I was always optimistic and, and, and just believing that God is gonna do something. In fact, uh, when he came in and uh, he gave me the diagnosis and he says, it is aplastic anemia. I'd already been Googling is what's the difference between aplastic anemia and leukemia. Uh, neither are good. And when he came in and he told me that it's aplastic, aplastic anemia, I said, uh, I said, amen. I says, uh, won't this be a great testimony when God heals me of this thing? And the oncologist looked at me, he says, you don't seem to understand. This is serious. I said, no, I've been reading about it. I, I know what it is, and, uh, but I'm believing God's going to heal me. He says, well, you know, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's hope so or something. He wasn't very positive. So one of the things that I did while I was in the hospital is that, again, God promised me, I'll, let's use the term pearls. God gave me pearls along the way. Not only his word is a promise that we all have a choice. Do we want to believe in what God's already said? Because when a person believes in what God's already said and receives it by faith, God moves. That's when we see things happen. So I've been doing this the whole time through the business downturn, everything else that I was dealing with, I was dealing with this issue now health. And it's like, you know, it just got worse and worse and worse. And now they're telling me I'm probably going to die. I mean, that's kind of the prognosis. So, but while I was in the hospital, I, I was reading and in the scripture, 
I read one day from uh, Acts 3.16, and uh, it's just another pearl that God gave me. When I read this verse, it says on the basis, they're talking about the, the, the blind man that got healed, and now he's healed, and, and, and everyone knew who he was. He was always begging every day, but now he's healed, and the verse says that uh, on the basis of faith in his name, it's the name of Jesus who's healed this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And so when I read that, talking about the, the blind beggar, I, I'm saying, that's going to be me. I said, that's going to be me. I said it inside. And immediately, God spoke to me. He says, that's the verse you're going to share with everyone on the day you're made whole. And I, I started, you know, I get teary and so forth when God kind of says some profound things to me like that. But that's what he said. And I says, amen, that's going to be me. And so, uh, and he reminded me that you're going to share that with everyone on the day you're made whole. So again, another pearl, another promise outside of God's word, but in consistency with his word, he gave me another promise that I'm going to be healed. Just along uh, the same as the, the verse, the same as Pastor Dave, when he said uh, he's preparing you for difficult times at lie head. Why would he prepare me if he wasn't going to get me through me, get me through it, right? And and uh, the first Peter 510, he's going to restore me, strengthen me. He, that was another promise, just out of the blue. Why would why I be up flipping channels and see that kind of verse that pertains to my situation? God has everything under control, just like he does with this pandemic. He's got everything under control. We just need to trust him. So anyway, while I'm in the hospital now, let's say I'm in there, you know, I'm in there for four weeks. What in the third week, they, they, uh, now are going to, they've said there's nothing they can do. They tried a couple of different things and there's no response. You know, they gave me horse blood transfusion. Can you believe that? Uh, and that was not fun because your body can react and mine did negatively. Uh, my body doesn't like horse blood for a transfusion. I can promise you that. So that didn't work. They were hoping to see if there's any stem cells they missed in the biopsy and there, there was no, just no, no results. So then they tested my siblings. I have three siblings and they tested because the only way that a person medically can get uh, surviving this aplastic anemia is if they get a transplant and it has to be a marrow match on all markers. So they tested my siblings and uh, then they tested, or they didn't test, but they searched the worldwide database. And the oncologist came in with the results and he said, uh, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. He says, but there, there was no match in your family. And there was no match anywhere in the world on, on all of the database search. And when he said that, I said, I didn't expect, I kind of felt in my spirit, they weren't, this isn't how God's going to do what he's going to do. I still believe I'm going to be healed, but I didn't believe it was going to be with a transplant. I just didn't believe it. So the doc came in, the oncologist, and he said, I'm, there is no match for you. And I said, amen, God considers me unique. Now, when he heals me, well, no, it wasn't medicine. And he looked at me puzzled, like I was some strange, strange guy, right? <laughs> and he, uh, he walked away, but that was my, that's what I believed. I mean, I still believe that God was going to do, do the miracle. So the next day he came and he says, you know, we can't keep you here anymore. We got to send you home. And so uh, he, he says, get ready. You're going home in two days. And I'm thinking, I've been in this special room called a neutropenic room where people can't come in unless they gown up and wash up, kind of like the pandemic stuff today, right? But even a little more so. And so they, uh, 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 he came in and he, he basically told me to get prepared. And on the day that I went home, he gave me some papers and some instructions. And he made it really clear. He says, stay away from your kids. Don't kiss your wife. Get rid of your pets and don't go out in public. And so he says, if you feel a temperature coming on, get back here immediately and so forth. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't a good situation. And, and every day I'm, I'm trying to stay optimistic with all this this uh, stuff going on in my head. Right. All you know, just physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you name it, it was all going on. And so when I first got home, I set up quarters or whatever you want to call it in the basement. I had to be away from everyone. Well, we didn't get rid of the pets and I did try to stay away from the family, but I set up camp downstairs in the basement away from everybody. And I hated that. I didn't want to stay down there. I don't want to kind of live like I'm going to die. So I says, I'm not going to, I, I can't do this. And I knew the importance of staying on track. I knew the importance of keeping strong in my faith. <clears throat> you know, scripture says life and death is in the power of the tongue. 
And so I knew scripture. So I started writing scripture down on post-it notes, positive affirmations in scripture, dealing with healing. God sent his word and healed us, me, you, and he delivered us from our destruction. That was one of my verses. And I wrote on the wall, uh, these little post-it notes. I put them on the wall, by the way, in different parts of the house. And I had a ritual, so to speak. Every time I entered that part of the house, I had to speak every one of those out loud, out loud to remind myself to keep strong. Do you think fear and doubt works in your advantage when you have a battle going on? Do you think there's an enemy out there trying to discourage you and break your faith? Absolutely. And I had to combat that. And I did it with these, these post-it notes all over the house. And I wanted to speak, you know, we, we all know positive affirmations go a long way. When you're fighting for your life, they go a lot, lot longer. You've got to do it. And, and that's what I did. So one of those post-it notes I'll share with you was, it's, it's an important one. So remember this one. Thank you, Lord, for the fresh, clean, healthy marrow. Now that's a positive affirmation because I've got none. Thank you, Lord, for the fresh, clean, healthy marrow. I had that on the wall. And so I continued to, uh, to live through this situation at home. And uh, uh, maybe the first, uh, continued, I, I'd say the first week I was home, God put it on my heart to tell everyone everything because I wanted to keep this a secret. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to run my business. I'm trying to keep it going uh you know with a lot of handicap going on but uh the lord told me to tell everyone everything and i, I didn't want to do that I, I wanted to kind of keep this a secret he says no tell everyone everything and i said well lord i know scripture and i know about stumbling stumbling blocks i believe you're going to heal me but if you don't then i don't want to be a stumbling block for all the people that i told you're going to heal me and then it doesn't happen and uh, it's kind of like God folded his arms and he just kind of turned. And I just, I had no connection for a couple of days. Then it dawned on me. I says, you know, I'm not doing what he asked me to do. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I, 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 I know you asked me to tell everyone everything and, and uh, I'm going to do it. I believe you're going to heal me. But with all due respect, if you don't, it's not going to be my problem. And, I, and I, that's what I prayed. And as soon as I said that, the Lord, again, speaks to me in my heart, and he says, I'm going to show myself strong through you before the eyes of many people, and I really cried on that one. That was just, that was just, because I knew he was there with me. That's another pearl, another reminder that he's going to do something, something big. I just got to stay the course, and then I put together a list. We didn't have social media back then. We didn't have the big social media uh, connections and Facebook and all that we had back then. Uh, you know, that's 20 years ago, so I got a list together of 22,000 people's email addresses. I, I worked on that to get that list. A lot of them were from Remax uh, around the world. I know a lot of Remax. I've been to 28 Remax conventions. Well, you know, not at the time, but I've been to many Remax conventions. And uh, uh, so a lot of they, a lot of them, and other friends were on the list. So I began telling them what was what was going on. The Lord says, "Tell them what has happened and tell them what's going to happen." And so I kind of recapped and started, you know, doing all these emails and, and about every other week, I'd give an update and give a report. And so uh, there's another interesting thing that I want to mention to you that happened in the midst of, you know, me now communicating with everybody, but something very, very unique happened about a week out of the hospital. Uh, a tenant of mine, I have rental property and a tenant came and, and just gave me a compelling story and said that the Lord told them, this couple, to bring me these herbs, these herbs, I should take these herbs, and God just put it on their heart that, that these, these can help me. And so I listened to their story, and I ran it by the oncologist, and they said, oh, no, 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 don't you, don't take herbs, that's the last thing you want to do when you have this kind of a condition. So now the doctor is saying, don't do this. The story was compelling. I prayed about it, and I started taking these herbs. These herbs are just, they're vitamins, minerals, and, and herbs just for, for good health, really. They, they weren't anything bizarre, to my opinion. And I, I read this little book about this, this organization that puts these herbs out. And in this book, it says that, you know, your body can heal itself. I said, well, that'd be nice. I mean, this is kind of a big deal to heal itself. But I went, and so anyway, I, I prayed about it and felt comfortable. And I began to take the herbs. I'm two days into taking the herbs. And I am thinking, okay, this book says the body can heal itself. Lord, I know you're going to heal me, but I want to know now in advance, 
Lord, tell me that you're going to do it and it's not the herbs. And this is what I've been praying for. And, and I got it. I got an answer. Uh, it was like a download. And I had a piece of paper next to my bed. I was, I was sleeping and praying and I just get this download. I'll never forget what the Lord said. Here's what he said. He says, the herbs are not going to heal you, but they're going to prepare your body for what I'm going to do. A farmer doesn't plant a seed in the field until he tills it, he readies it, and he takes care of the field. You take care of your body, and I will plant the seed of marrow, and it will grow 100-fold. Just like that. And I wrote it all down, and it's like, again, tearful moment. It's another pearl. It's another promise. A hundredfold is like perfection. God says, you do what I'm asking you to do, proceed, and then I'm going to do what no one else can do. I'm going to plant the seed of marrow, and it'll grow a hundredfold. Medically, marrow doesn't grow back. It does not grow back. So now I'm hearing something that he's going to do something that's medically impossible, telling me in advance. So I'm writing this and telling the people on the email distribution chain that this is what's going to happen. And I know a lot of people thought I was kind of crazy. Even some of the people at the church I heard about later, the leadership. Uh, but I will give credit to Pastor Dave because he stuck with me and he, he believed and even wrote in my book, which all these emails, by the way, turned into a book. Dave said that I stuck with Jeff, even though it stretched my faith to places that's never been before. But if Jeff hadn't taken this approach, I believe he'd be dead today. That's exactly what he said. And I probably agree with him 100%. So... I'm, I'm proceeding now. Um, let me fast forward a little bit through the next few months. Every three days, I go in to get a blood test. The blood numbers fell, transfusion time. And because the blood cells are not being produced, there's no marrow. So I had to use other people's blood. Thank uh, the Lord. I was O positive. I could get blood easily. And I'd like to say thank you to all the donors. If you've ever donated blood, thank you, because people like me need it. At the time, I needed that. And so every three days I'd go in and I'd get, get some uh, uh, blood test, the numbers had dropped, the blood counts, transfusion, and it just like clockwork. And so uh, during that time, again, I wanna emphasize the doubt and the fear was always knocking on the door every day, every hour, but those positive affirmations and those Bible promises and, and, and you know, when those negative thoughts come in and we face them, we may be facing them today with a pandemic. We may, be, may face them with a business failure or a relationship. Negative thoughts is a weapon of the enemy, but the scripture tells us that we're to take those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What does that mean? It means to, when, when, when we recognize, we know Everyone knows what a negative thought is. Everyone knows what doubt and fear is. When those thoughts come in, we're to take them captive and we're to fight against them by speaking out truth of God's promises. As scripture says that um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal in nature. They're not natural, but they're powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Scripture also says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realm. That's the battle Paul talked about in Ephesians 6, 12. He says, that's the battle we wrestle with. It's all spiritual. So when we take those thoughts, those negative thoughts captive, we can overcome things. God's promised us that. And he asks us and encourages us to do that. I did this every day, every hour. You think, you don't think, I, you think that they went away because I'm, I'm, I'm strong? No, in my weakness, I became strong, but I just follow what God told me to do. And I continued to believe that I was going to be healed one day, one way, I didn't know how, and I didn't know when, but I kept the faith and I kept going through this. So fast forwarding now through till we get to uh, August 3rd, I had just got my 41st blood transfusion, about four months into this process. And uh, I went up to North Heights, they had a, a Holy Spirit conference going on. And I, after the transfusion, I wanted to hear this woman speak about miraculous healing. I, I thought this is something I really want to hear. And so there's about 200 people in this workshop. And uh, uh, I sat in the back of the room, I'm just trying to be mindful. I mean, during this period of time, I, I couldn't live, by the way, I, I, I got to say, I couldn't live like I was going to die, as I mentioned that earlier. I went on listing appointments. 
I started showing homes with no immune system. As I think about it today, the mind says, are you nuts? Are you crazy? Why would you do that? Because I had to live like I was going to live and not like I was going to die. I prayed about it. I wrote it in the emails and I said, boy, I don't want to be stupid here. I mean, dying because of stupidity would be the worst way to go. And so I, I went through prayerful each day. I, I said, prayer, I, I pray. And I said, Lord, give me a bubble of protection. I, I, I need to get out there. And I was tired. I was weak. And, you know, my mind wasn't working as, as, as it should uh, because you're forgetful. If I'm on the phone, I'm taking notes, by the way, just because I'd forget things. Uh, 30 seconds ago, I, what did I, what was I talking about? Because the hemoglobin counts are so low. So in any case, I, uh, uh, I went to this event. I'm at, uh, I'm at North Heights. And this woman spoke, gave a great testimony. At the end of her testimony, this guy, you know, he's in his 70s and he comes up on the stage. He says, if you want prayer with Marlene, then come on forward. And about half this group went up to the front. I'm sitting in the back in the corner. I says, Lord, do you want me to go pray with Marlene? And I waited a minute. I waited two minutes, maybe even three minutes. I didn't hear anything. And then all of a sudden he says, no, go pray with that man. So that man was a guy who was on the microphone. And I was looking for him, and then I saw him, and he was kind of packing and getting ready to leave the room. And I kind of hurried up, and I, and I tapped him on the shoulder, and I says, uh, excuse me, I says, can I pray with you? And he says, uh, yeah, sure, sure, grab a seat. And we put some folding chairs face to face. He says, what would you like to pray about? I said, well, I says, I, I was in the hospital back in April, and I was there for a month. And uh, the doctors, they, they diagnosed me with a blood disease, and they, they said it's going to kill me. And stop, he said. He just boldly said, stop. He reached out, he put his hand on my head, and he says, the Lord wants you to know that a curse has come against your bone marrow from four generations ago, and he's breaking it now, and he's filling your bones with fresh, clean, healthy marrow. And, and I started to laugh, and I started to cry, and I... I says, how did you know that? And as he got up to walk away, he says, the Lord's used me this way for years. I still get emotional this 20 years ago. And uh, I got on the phone. I called home. I started calling my friends. I says, I just got the miracle. I told them what happened. I was so excited. There's no way this guy could have known. I mean, he, he knew the spirit of the Lord gave him divine prophetic insight as to what was going on inside of my body. And the Lord used him to speak and broke a curse. And I came to learn, I came to learn later that my grandmother on my dad's side, who they didn't have the technology of medicine back then, she died of a blood disease. Maybe it was the same thing. Uh, you know, so uh, it, it's just amazing. But anyway, I, uh, I I was just telling everyone I was super excited. I didn't really feel anything different, but there's no way that that man could have said what he said. And you know what he said? The same thing that was on my wall. Remember what I said earlier? Remember this? Thank you, Lord, for the fresh, clean, healthy marrow. And that man said the Lord's breaking a curse and filling your bones with what? Fresh, clean, healthy marrow. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. The very words that I spoke on the wall that I spoke every day, he spoke. He spoke the same words. So uh, this just, God is amazing. Trust me. He, he can do anything beyond anything we could ever ask or think. And I, I believed it would be one day, one day, somehow. And that was the day. It was August 3rd of 2001. So I'm on a regimen. Three days later, I go back to the hospital and what do they do? They do a blood test. That's the first thing they do. And the nurses said, well, this is interesting. Your blood numbers have actually gone up slightly instead of dropping. Uh, we really don't need to give you a transfusion today. And I said, I told you the Lord was going to heal me. And he did. And they said, well, you come back again in three days and we'll have your transfusion waiting for you. That's exactly what they said. And uh, three days later, I went back. And they gave me another blood test. And they said, this is, this is interesting. Your blood numbers have inched up again. They don't, they don't inch up unless there's marrow. There's no way, because where, where's the blood cells coming from? The increased count. 
They said, wait here, we're going to go get the oncologist. So the doctor that I was with in the hospital for that 28 days, he's all faith, or I'm all faith, and he's all medicine. We were kind of like this. And he came out with his clipboard. Oh, this is really interesting. And, and I said, well, doctor, what do you attribute this to? And I wasn't trying to be smart ass, but you know, that's what I said. I said, what do you attribute this to? I, I knew that I knew that I knew. I know that I'm, I'm going back to normal. And he says, well, you know, he's trying to, well, the horse blood transfusion must be kicking. I said, well, you know, at the time, you know, you told me that was going to work. Uh, if it worked at all, it would work within two weeks. I mean, it's been four months. Why would it be working now? Well, I don't know. Sometimes it just kicks in late. So he couldn't explain anything. He had no answer to it. And I, I kind of just jumped in and he says, well, I just want you to know. In any case, whatever, whatever, you know, you might, might think about this. I just want you to know that my blood levels are going all the way back to normal. And he says, when they, he says, when you have aplastic anemia, they never go back to normal. I said, maybe so, but I don't have it anymore. And he looked at me as puzzled as anyone I've ever seen. And he walked away. It's the last time I saw that doctor. I only talked to him one month later in September and my blood levels had continued to increase. And so keep in mind, I'm writing everyone. I'm trying to, you know, I, keep everyone posted as to what's going on. And I thought, well, I, I know I'm going to get better. I know I'm going all the way back to normal. But even in the process, I still had these negative thoughts. The enemy was still there trying to cause me to doubt. And, and there, was, there was battles emotionally and spiritually. But during this time, I also wanted to try to record something. I wanted to, to, to see, you know, it, it, it sounds kind of silly, but I'm, I'm writing and I'm trying to make sure I have a good, a good story to tell. And I know I'm going to have a good story to tell. So I thought, let me go see. I'm going to go out and jog a block and see what, what that's like, because I'm still weak. And I couldn't jog a block. I couldn't even go a block. I would, <sighs> I'm out of breath and my legs would fall asleep. You know, we've all crossed our legs or sat wrong or something. And then we fall, our legs fall asleep. And if you were to just get up and try to take a couple of quick steps, you're going to fall. That's exactly what happened. I only, if I took another step, I would have fallen because my legs fell asleep while I'm trying to jog down the street. So I knew that I had no energy. I want to fast forward a little bit now and go out to, uh, to November. Okay, I'm getting stronger and stronger and stronger every day. And in November, I had so much energy. My mind was sharp again. The oxygen was back. My blood, my hemoglobin was back to normal in three months. The marrow was growing back. And I decided I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to run a mile around the track because I have so much energy. I, I'm not like a track star, but I'm just going to run, 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 like kind of like Forrest Gumpers. I'm going to go run and see what I can do. And I ran a 640 mile. When I couldn't jog a block three months earlier because my legs would fall asleep, I had all this energy. I'm not a track star. I wasn't in training. I just got on that track and I just ran. Because I just, I just wanted to show everyone that I'm telling the story to that God said he would, he would restore me. He would strengthen me. It's exactly what he did. And I wanted to prove it. I wanted to be a testimony that, that he did what he says he would do. That was 20 years ago in August when that began. And, and 20 years ago, this is 2021. And that was 2001. And so with, with my story, I, I, I encourage you with whatever you're going through to know the word of God, know what his promises are. There's seven or 8,000 promises in the scriptures and they're there for everyone. God's no respecter of persons. That's a scripture verse. He's no respecter of persons. And if he healed one person, I believe he'll heal the next person. But fear and doubt overcome people. They have a tendency to do that. There's a real enemy. There's a real, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I came to give faith and give life and give it abundantly. And that, that's what's available to us when we believe. When I, uh, with all these emails, by the way, I turned it into a book, uh, Journey to a Miracle, When Faith Was the Only Cure. And every book, I, I sign books, I give books away, and you know you can buy them online and so forth. But I, I sign books and I always write the, the scripture in, in the cover when I write a little note to someone. It's Hebrews 6.12. And here's what it says. It says, be an imitator of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So just duplicate. Duplicate my example that I've shared with you today. Duplicate what others who through faith and patience inherit 
God's promises. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. He wants us to trust him and he's willing to deliver. He's looking for people that believe in what he's already said and stand on his promises, no matter what the circumstances, who walk by faith and not by sight and don't get overcome with fear and doubt. We stand on God's promises and we can see mountains move. Nothing, nothing is impossible to those who believe. So in, in closing, I just want to say a prayer for everyone. And then uh, maybe there's questions and answers. I'll be happy to try to answer those. But uh, Lord, I just pray for the group today, the group that's listening, anyone that might be listening to this, to this uh, uh, recording in the future. Uh, I just thank you for everyone that's here and everyone that uh, is dealing with the same situation, you know, pandemic wise, maybe there's other personal things going on, relationships, health issues, but Lord, your promises are true and they're available for everyone. And I just wanna thank you for your, your amazing, uh, beyond anything we could ever think or ask for, ability to do wondrous and miraculous things in our life. And I thank you for what you've done with me, and I pray for a blessing upon everyone uh, that's listening to this, upon their business, upon their family, upon their health, upon their finances, and we just know that you're able to deliver the exceeding abundancy that you and only you can promise. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The floor mic is muted. Steve? Yes, go ahead. Oh, Jeff, I just want to say thank you. Um, I, I was on some of those emails and I remember your journey and I, I'll have to say when it first came out and you know this, you already said some people at, even at church, you're like, what, what's going on with Jeff? Is he, I mean, is this serious? Is he losing it? <laughs> and next thing you know, as you're following your story, you're just like, oh, praise the good Lord. This is incredible. So um, I know that it was an incredible, incredible uh, journey of a lot of uh, overcoming and a lot of triumphs. And I'm glad that it has continued to keep you healthy. So, Amen. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you, Colleen. It's uh, nice that you kind of come alongside me for all those years, too. So. Are there any other questions? Bob Bear. Bob has a question. Uh, Jeff, Bob Bear here. Uh, Mike, my question is, what did the doctors ultimately write on your chart at the end of all? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. That's a great question. And to my knowledge, nothing. The, the oncologist that I work with, he, he basically, in my opinion, was so dumbfounded and couldn't explain it and I, I kept telling him that I don't have it anymore. The disease is gone. And, you know, it was verified not only by the oncologists, there was hematologists, there was, a, there was about three different ones at United 